How do you grieve what could have been? Bonjourno and welcome to the author's preface show where we look at the story behind the story and find out how authors are forged. I am your host, Sam Hale. Thanks again for checking out the pod. I do appreciate it. So what's good with me? I decided to read something in the vein of Cormac McCarthy in terms of how dark can you go? It's a novel called Tender is the Flesh. I'll just preface right away. If you were not the kind of person who enjoyed Blood Meridian or The Road, I'm just using McCarthy here as kind of a benchmark because there are some similarities here, (laughs) then you will not enjoy Tender as the Flesh. The premise is more or less on the tin, so I don't mind sharing it, which is that a supposed disease has made it so every animal on the planet is infected and eating that animal will kill you. So human beings as we are prone to doing, adapt, and cannibalism becomes sanctioned, systematic, and institutionalized. It's a pretty rough read, but I'll tell you what, I really enjoyed it. The prose are fantastic. It is in a third-person present narrative style that I found really interesting. It was very compelling. It kept things moving, and you're really in the I almost called him the protagonist's head, but I don't know what you'd call this guy. I was in the main character's head. Really enjoyed it. Uh, Again, it's very dark. There's all kinds of warnings I could throw out there. But just know if you're not down with reading about people leading people, this ain't your book. Similarly dark, because that's just what I'm kicking right now. Just watched Knock at the Cabin, which is an adaptation of the dark fantasy novel Cabin at the End of the World. Premise is relatively simple. A couple and their daughter go on a little getaway in a nice cabin tucked out in the woods. And then they get a knock at the cabin door. (laughs) The titular title of the movie coming into play. Four people show up with an insane proposition. And the stakes could not be any higher. They are, dare I say, biblical. This is also a pretty intense film. It's M. Night Shyamalan making what I think is somewhat of a comp- comeback, though it is not an original script from him. I think maybe that's where he needs to be for a while, is to adapt strong work and put his own spin on it, though he did have some help with the screenwriting. Dave Batista surprising me once again with his acting chops, basing that on his performance in the latest Blade Runner film. I like seeing this. He's not going to win an Oscar for any of this stuff. But I love being surprised by the versatility of folks you thought you had pinned down and they just blow you away. So there's Tender is the Flesh if you want a dark novel and then Knock at the Cabin if you want a dark film. I must be working some stuff out right now. I don't know. One thing I'm not working out is whether or not I enjoyed speaking with today's guest, Karen Odin, because it was a fantastic conversation. Karen was a treat to talk to a historical mystery, historical fiction writer. She has written titles such as A Lady in the Smoke, which was a USA Today bestseller, A Dangerous Duet, A Trace of Deceit, Down a Dark River, and Under a Veiled Moon, which is the title I read in preparation for our conversation, which was a Lefty Award nominee and Agatha Award nominee as well. Awarded a research and development grant from the Arizona Commission on the Arts, winner of Arizona New Mexico Book Awards for Fiction and Mystery. Karen also has a newsletter that comes out every six weeks, including an essay and regular book giveaways. Pretty cool. You can subscribe to that on her website, which is www.karenodin.com. Odin is spelled O. D-D-E-N. And since 2019, she has been teaching writing seminars on craft and querying agents in writing groups across the U.S. She's also a member of the Mystery Writers of America and the Historical Novel Society, something I intend to look into. Also a member of the Sisters in Crime National Board, member of Desert Sluice and Grand Canyon Writers. Education Cornell, Bachelor's in Biology and English, University of Michigan, she has a master's, and New York University, PhD, and we get into all that good stuff. Favorite hobbies, hiking the desert. If you want to find Karen's novels, newsletter, all that good stuff, like I said, KarenOden.com. You can also find her on Facebook at KarenOden, Twitter at K 
Karen underscore Odin. Instagram, Karen underscore M underscore Odin. Covered some really interesting stuff today talking about the origins of diagnosing PTSD uh, in connection to major railway disasters in 19th century London. We talk about NYU's plethora of Victorian era professors and how that spurred Karen along into her genre as well as the set and setting. We discussed the concept of orphans in the 19th century as sort of a trope and also get into the idea of self-determination blossoming from this kind of orphan mentality. Some really interesting stuff about the discussion she had back and forth with her colleagues, people she was publishing through on titles as well as cover art. This is something I wonder about. Uh, one of the benefits of doing self-publishing, obviously, is you can pretty much contract out and get it however you like. But in the traditional publishing world, this is a conversation I hear come up pretty often, and it is compelling. I really enjoyed that discussion, and uh, I hope it illuminates some things for you. It's a really cool idea, too, that Karen brought to mind, which is how writing a book, as well as the finished project, is sort of like having a child, how you bring this thing into the world, how you nurture it, how it gives back. Uh, it was a really cool conversation. I really enjoyed it. And the analogy there I found pretty poignant. And alongside that, realizing how we rarely write in a vacuum. And then a lot of our characters and our stories are derived from personal experience or even shared experience if we're talking about larger traumatic incidents which certainly pertinent to what Karen is writing about in her novels. This was a lot of fun. You can hear me geeking out. I did my best not to interrupt Karen. She was fantastic, very charitable with her time. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. So let's get to Karen Odin's preface. And I am here with Karen Odin today. Karen, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Of course. So I will have outlined who you are, all your bona fide, but for people who maybe didn't have a chance to hear that, can you just kind of go over who you are, what you were writing, maybe some of your interests? So I live here in Scottsdale, Arizona, and I have been writing mystery set in 1870s London for about 10 years. My first book was published in 2016, and my most recent was published last October. Um, and right now I am working on a, this is, I'm writing the third in the series um, for Inspector Corabin, who is an inspector at Scotland Yard. He's a former thief and bare knuckles boxer who's trying to make good in the world. That's excellent. And I was really enjoying reading about his uh, adventures in Whitechapel, London. So let's get right into your preface because I'm pretty eager to hear it. Karen, you and I have some similarities in that we both come from a academic background. I was really interested when I read your bio on Amazon. And then when I actually got to check out your preface, I was kind of geeking out here a little bit. So can you tell us what your life was like prior to writing fiction? Sure. I did my PhD in Victorian literature at NYU. And I wrote my dissertation on Victorian railway disasters, of all things, because I was interested in the origins of PTSD, which actually began in the 1860s with medical men and legal men talking about these terrible railway injuries and people crawling out of them and then belatedly having all these strange symptoms, which we would call PTSD, but they called it railway spine because they didn't know what exactly was going on. Anyway. I finished my dissertation, I defended it, got my PhD, and did not get a job, a tenure-track job as a professor. And at the time, I was in Milwaukee, actually, and I was teaching at the university there just as an adjunct, some classes on literary theory, classes on Victorian novel, that kind of thing. And then we ended up moving back to New York. 9-11 happened. We moved out of New York to Arizona. And so in 2006 or seven, somewhere around there, I was at home with the two kids. They were little. My husband was traveling a lot. And I thought, 
how about if I just see if I can write a novel? I had written a lot of literary criticism about novels. I had uh, written an introduction and notes for Victorian novels in the Barnes and Noble classic series. I had uh, taught classes about novels and little did I know that I really didn't know a whole lot about writing a novel. Now I'd written one really bad novel back in my early twenties. It was sort of a mashup of some of my favorite authors, Robert Ludlum, a little Helen McGinnis thrown in and a story that I'd read in the New Yorker about Nazi war loot. So I kind of threw all that into a pod and sort of wrote a novel and it's in a drawer, which is where it belongs. That was kind of my only attempt at writing a novel um, before this. And then, so there I was in 2000, I guess it was around seven, 2007, when I started working on the book that would eventually become A Lady in the Smoke, my first book. Your PhD kind of dissertation really caught my interest. Um, I didn't have time to look it up. Um, You shouldn't. (laughs) (laughs) It's unfortunate, you know, because there's a lot of great academic writing out there, but it's not quite as accessible because a lot of the jargon, the vernacular, if you're not on the inside, it can be tough to access, but I didn't have a chance to look at it. So I did want to see as one historical fiction writer to another kind of geeking out here, but what were some of the observations that 19th century physicians or psychologists were coming up with when they started looking at this thing that we now know as PTSD, what were some of the conclusions they came to? It's interesting because in the 1850s, there was this act called the Medical Act, which sought in England to unite the physician trained, uh, I'm sorry, the university trained physicians with the apprentice trained surgeons. And then you had the apothecaries. Now in the mid 1850s, the whole medical profession was kind of considered like about an inch above quackery. They really didn't know what they were doing. And so this medical act was ostensibly going to unite the three professions and get them all on the same page and then start kind of professionalizing these, you know, these practitioners with things like the Lancet, which was their medical journal, um, with training programs, with, with all this kind of stuff. Right around the exact same time, you know, the railways had really taken off beginning in the 1830s, but really a huge explosion of railways in the 1840s. And by the 1850s, there were a lot of accidents happening because there were no safety devices and none of the railway companies were talking to each other because they were all independently owned joint stock companies. So some of them were putting building on narrow gauges and some of them had wide gauges and some of them said, sure, you can have open lanterns and with flames in them in the carriages. And some said, no, 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 we, that's not such a good idea. I, I mean, there was no consensus. So for example, you had someone like Charles Dickens in 1865 crawling out of the Staplehurst railway crash. Back then, they didn't have brakes on all of the carriages. They had them on like the first three or four, and then everybody else would just sort of smash in. So by 15 or 20 cars down the line, everything's falling over and- Pancaking. Yeah, and and zigzagging across the tracks, and and they're totally destabilized. The the car that Charles Dickens was in did topple over. Uh, He was traveling actually with his- Uh, his mistress, the young, pretty actress, Ellen Ternan, and her mother. And he crawled out of the train and dragged the two of them out behind him. And he had some brandy with him. And he started walking around ministering to people. And then the railway company sent a train down from London, an express train, about because Staplers was about 70 miles from London. So they sent the train down. Charles got on, you know, Ellen and her mother got on. They were whisked back to London. Charles went home, went to bed. And the next day he got up and his hand was shaking so badly he could not write his name. He developed twitches. Uh, He developed feelings of like shock and and pinpoints going up and down his legs. He had nightmares that were so bad he would not go to bed. He would sit at his desk and fall asleep at his desk because he didn't want to go for the nightmares. He died five years to the day after the train crash. And his son, in his memoir, said, you know, my father never recovered. So Charles Dickens, uh, he gave us a nice written account of his symptoms and things like that. So we have accounts like his to go by. But the medical men were also writing treatises and books and articles in The Lancet and, and this kind of thing about the injuries that they were seeing sort of across the board with these people. And they were everything that you would expect, the same kinds of things that they saw, you know, the Freud and Breuer saw in the 1890s with hysterics, same kind of thing that the World War I doctors were seeing with the men coming back from the trenches. 
there's a sort of a coterie of medical men, sympathetic medical men, who said, we can't exactly explain what's going on, but it's real. And they called it railway spine to tie it to an organ because under existing medical jurisprudence, these people who were trying to sue the railways couldn't get money unless it was organic, tied to an organ. So that's why they came up with railway spine. They, they, they knew that they couldn't just call it nerves or something like that. So a lot of the railway surgeons who were sympathetic would say that. But then you had this other group, um, many of whom were hired by the railway company saying these people are all malingering. They're just trying to sue us and get money. So the legal cases, which were widely reported in the newspapers, often verbatim, became almost like a theater for medical men to argue this stuff out. And of course, the legal men had their opinions too. So they were trying to come up with a theory that would, would hold water. I mean, obviously, no one's going to cut someone open and find out whether there really was railway spine. There were like these little cuts that they said were in the on the spinal material. And at the same time, um, enable people to sue and get some compensation when the railway crash happened. That's really interesting. And I think in Under a Veiled Moon, which I thoroughly enjoyed reading, I get to get out of my genre pretty often for this job. And I loved the book. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I say fun before what I'm about to describe, which is you go into, I mean, within the first, you know, according to my Kindle, 5% of the book, you talk about a serious railroad accident. Accident. I'm not spoiling anything because you know, it's on the uh, on the synopsis for the book itself. You also go into the accident with the Princess Alice, mm-hmm. kind of a pleasure boat that's going up and down the Thames. The Thames, I always mispronounce it. The Thames, mm-hmm. yeah. The Thames, thank you. And you did an excellent job of, as Inspector Corvin's getting there very soon after this traumatic incident, going through and showing a lot of the physiological responses of the people who are dragging themselves out of the river and that uh, this was an intensely devastating traumatic experience. One of the best things I, I think you can say about historical fiction, you're not only enjoying it, but you feel like you're learning something. And two, as I was reading your book, I had to have a cup of tea with me because I was enjoying it so much. And it just so happened to start raining. And I thought, ah, this is perfect. Miserable, industrial era, smog ridden, acid rain coming down. Not really in my world, at least. (laughs) I've got some experience with this. I read an excellent book called The Body Keeps the Score. Oh, it's a great book. It's a great book. All about that internalization of trauma. So I want to compliment you on that because you did an excellent job. You know, it was entertaining in all the right kind of ways. So I don't know if it happened while in your PhD program, you did mention some of the authors that inspired you. Was there a specific person? Was there one of those books that really kind of set you off? Was there a moment where you decided to yourself, I want to be a writer? It didn't happen until well after I finished the PhD, um, which was in 2001. I think it was really just, I was at home with the kids and, you know, I, I love, I mean, I have fantastic children and they were a lot of fun, but I definitely felt as though my brain was getting a little muddy around the edges. I wanted something that was, that I could work it around nap schedules and school schedules and, you know, Julia's ice skating. And, you know, I guess I thought, well, I've written one novel, however bad it was, and a dissertation, which was over 300 pages. I know how to finish a project. I can do that. But when it came to figuring out what do I want to write about, I thought, what do I know that hasn't been done a million times before? And so I put a young woman heroine, a lady, Elizabeth Fraser, and her laudanum addicted mother (laughs) on a train in 1874 London, and I ran it off the rails. (laughs) And that was the beginning. (laughs) I bet you cannot imagine where I, you have no idea where that idea came from, I'm sure. (laughs) It's hard not to feel a bit of a, like a bit of a sadist when you hear about these awful events and you go, ah, that's a great idea for a story. Yeah. One thing I, I noticed about your book's And also it's in your bio and it was great because again, I felt like I was being educated about something I'm not that familiar with. You are in the 19th century London wheelhouse full tilt. And I want to know why that is because obviously it's a massive, massively important period in uh, Western European history, for example, 
um, the industrial revolution, which is permeating every cell of under a veiled moon, which is great. The attention to detail with just the smell in certain parts of London was great. So why 19th century London? When I arrived at NYU back in 1995 or six, I don't remember exactly when it was. One of the first classes I took was a Victorian novel class with a professor, uh, Carol Endeavor. She's up in uh, Dartmouth now. The class was called The Dead Mother. If you take a look at Victorian novels, there are a lot of orphans running around. You've got Jane Eyre, you have... Oliver Twist. Yeah, Oliver Twist and, you know, Pip from Great Expectations and Daniel Deronda. I mean, they're, they're, they're everywhere. You know, we talked about why. And I think that some of this has to do with that in the 18th century, who you were and your place in society was very determined by who your parents were and what you inherited from them. And, it, uh, you know, your wealth and your titles were tied to land. However, in the 19th century, you know, you raised the point about the Industrial Revolution being in full tilt. Well, it was. And so there were new sources of income. You know, you could be a self-made person, man. <laughs> I'm going to use that term advisedly because most of them were men. But, the, you know, with industries that, that, that were not tied to the land, they were railways and newspapers and manufacturing and shipping and all of these other industries that kind of came into being you know, in great part because of railways. So people had more ability to determine their selves and determine their own identity and their own place in society. And I think that the orphan, to some extent, is a trope for that ability to kind of push aside the parents and say, okay, I'm going to decide for myself who I'm going to be and what I'm going to become. Anyway, I became very engrossed in, I I loved all the Victorian novels. I love the big ones like Bleak House. I mean, they are big baggy monsters and they're fabulous, full of great characters and all kinds of interesting um, reflections on the culture of the time. And I was lucky in that NYU had four Victorianists, all reading different kinds of things and working on different kinds of Victorian materials because the Victorian period was long. It was from 1837 to 1901, which is why a lot of times scholars will break it up into early, middle, and high Victorian, because you can't make generalizations about the Victorian period. I mean, it would be like us saying, let's make generalizations about the United States that hold true from 1959 to today. It's impossible because we underwent the sea change of the internet. They underwent the sea change of the railways and industrialization. So... Victorian period is full of change. And when I was studying at NYU, I was reading not just Victorian novels, but Victorian poetry, medical literature, Charles Darwin, Sigmund Freud, um, Henry Morton Stanley's Journeys to Africa, diaries, um, you know, sort of ephemera, all different kinds of things. And I realized how rich the period was. And part of the reason I choose the 1870s for all of my books is I think it's the most interesting decade. I mean, there are a couple of reasons, but in the 1860s, there were a few key things that happened. One of them was that um, the vote was expanded to another half million men. And you didn't just have landed people or even people who were landed with some money. They, you had a lot more different kinds of people voting and talking. And the stamp tax had been revoked. So you had all of a sudden all these newspapers Like in 1830, I think there were 40 newspapers in London. By 1880s, there were almost a thousand. So you have people writing and talking and and sharing ideas in a different way. And as a result, in the 1870s, there were a whole bunch of new laws that were passed that changed things and began making significant legal changes that would then eventually reshape the social and economic structures. For example, under the legal doctrine of coverture, a married woman was not allowed to own or inherit property. She could not initiate a lawsuit. Her husband had to do it for her. Her children did not belong to her. Anything she brought to the marriage did not belong to her, belonged to her husband. She was literally legally covered by her husband's identity. But in 1870, there was an act passed called the Married Women's Property Act, which meant that a working woman who earned her own money, her wages in a mill or a shop, could keep her money. 
and did not have to hand it over. It was not legally her husband's. And this is just one tiny little crack. It's like the beginning of gender equality. And it's important. It happens in 1870. There were changes in education, law. I mean, all different kinds of things that were happening right in there. And I think it's just a a decade of explosive, fascinating change. And you do a great job of highlighting one of the characters, Ma, who is, she's not from the landed gentry. She's a self-made woman. Mm -hmm. You talk at length about the Irish question, which is a big part of the kind of socioeconomic landscape in London at that time, signs everywhere saying, Nina, Mm -hmm. no Irish need apply. I really found it interesting. And I'd known a little bit about the Irish question, which is kind of the proper noun, the Irish capital Q question that was proposed by... um, Gladstone. Thank you. That was fascinating. So again, that attention to detail, the milieu, I think is one of the things I appreciate most about Under a Failed Moon. The world building, if I'm putting it in the fantasy kind of terms there, was there any kind of connective tissue with your own family history with things such as the Irish question? There was not. I I, I have red hair, but I am not Irish, mostly German and Dutch. I think that sometimes for me, and I don't know whether this is true for all writers, but when I find something that surprises me, it's almost like it latches on and clings. And one of the things that surprised me was the vitriol and the centrality of the anti-Irish sentiment. When I read things that Prime Minister Disraeli wrote about the Irish and published, not in some marginal, like lunatic fringe newspaper, but in the London Times about the Irish being a, you know, sort of lazy, unethical race. I, it startled me. I, I I thought, oh, wow. That was one of those things. I discovered it about halfway through writing Down a Dark River. And I thought, okay, I can't add this into this book. This is going to go in my next book. But it did, it did definitely inform Michael Corvin's character and help me understand how he is an outsider twice over. First of all, because he's Irish. And secondly, because he's in Scotland Yard at a time when nobody trusts the Yard because... Of course, the trial had just happened where four of the inspectors had been accused and convicted of taking bribes. So here he is, you know, Irish and in the yard, nobody's going to talk to him. So I think, that, but I think that the Irish question, as I was researching, I thought, I need to write about this. It's a compelling piece of history. All right. So on to more optimistic topics here. You've made the decision and you want to write about a specific period. You've got all the right kinds of instruction and schooling in it. What kinds of baby steps did you start taking toward becoming a committed writer in your genre? Well, I wrote a first draft and I took an online writing class through ASU. It was the first year they were offering it and... They had some bugs to work out of of it, but I did I did definitely feel like I was learning, you know, sort of as learning some interesting things and going meta on the novel writing process. Then I joined a little writing group. There were four or five of us who would all exchange work. That was really helpful. And I thought my book was done and I sent it out to, I don't know, 30 or 40 agents and got rejected or got nothing back. Um, we would get you know, some every I'd go to the mailbox. This was still back when it was being done by sort of snail mail. And I'd go to the mailbox and usually there was nothing. And then once in a while, I'd find that thin envelope with one third of a piece of paper that was, you know, that said, this is not right for us at this time, you know, <laughs> um, most often I didn't get anything back. And I started to get very discouraged, but everyone told me it would, you know, you have to be persistent and you have to kind of keep going. And so I revised it again. I started reading books about writing, sent out a bunch more, got a bunch more rejections. And at one point I was going to give up. I actually thought I am going to go to back to grad school and get a master's in social work. And I want to be a therapist. And, you know, when you think about it, therapy and writing are very linked. You are assembling coherent stories and helping other people assemble coherent stories in order to reach some kind of resolution or knowledge or, you know, enlightenment or something. 
so I went so far as to like look into programs and things. And then I had a friend who told me, you can't give up. You've, there's got to be some somebody out there who can help you do this. And through this all, I have to say, my husband was an absolute rock. He kept saying, you're going to figure this out. Just keep on going. And a friend had just been to a writer's conference and she said, I, I met this freelance writer, freelance editor. She said, really nice. And do you want me to give you her name? So I contacted her. Her name was Maisie Coburn. She's actually now an editor full-time for Tin House. So I sent the manuscript to her and I'm sure she thought, uh, if this is going to be, you know, <laughs> like, she's going to be like, okay, well, I have to do it because, you know, her friend, I know her friend and she recommended her, but, but she actually called and said, you know what, I can help you with this. You've got, you've got some good material here. And the first thing she said to me was, you need to take the first seven chapters and throw them out. And I was horrified. You know, I, I mean, I'm a pack rat. I mean, you can see behind me, like, what do my bookshelves look like? I am a pack rat by nature. I don't throw anything away. And I thought, oh, hundreds of my beautiful words. And I said, yes, but, you know, there's all this interesting stuff, backstory about Elizabeth and her relationship, her troubled relationship with her mother and her father and his father's affair and railways and narrow gauges and wide gauges and tunnels and, you know, railway development. And she says, yes. And she says, all of those things belong in your head as you write, they do not belong on the page. And that distinction was very helpful to me. So I, I, I cheated. I took this first seven page, first seven chapters, and I put them in a separate Word document, <laughs> saved them. Because the reason she wanted me to do that was that in chapter eight was my train wreck. That was what she called the inciting event. And she said, your inciting event has to be in chapter one. It cannot be tucked all the way in chapter eight. Something about the way that she was talking started clicking. And so we spent the next six months working on the, on the book. She, you know, we talked about the balance of dialogue and description, the need for a plot arc and a character arc, the character arc being the, you know, the character changing and the plot arc being the thing that causes them to change the struggles, the challenges, the changes. We talked about secondary characters and how to make them round and interesting and not merely serve the plot of the protagonist. So by the end of the six months, I had a different book. This time I sent it out to 10 agents and six of them wrote back and said, sure, we'll take a look. Wow. And then two of them offered representation. In terms of statistics, I mean, that's statistically significant number of people for just about yeah. anybody looking to get published. So it sounds like you already had the talent. It was just a matter of rearranging the story itself. Yes, but also learning about things like stakes. Hmm. You know, you, you have that exciting event, the railway, but then, okay, so the, the stakes initially are, well, we have to save Lady Elizabeth and her mother and get them out of the field and get them someplace safe. Well, then what? You know, then what else, what, you know, oh, well, then we find out that it might be sabotage. Well, then we find out that parliamentary members might be involved. And then we find out the money is involved. And then Elizabeth finds out that, oh, no, my dad might be involved. You know, but, you know, kind of, so, but how do you set those stakes in place? How do you get that trajectory going? And how is Elizabeth going to change as a result? Hmm. So all of that work, which is the kind of what I think of as the deep structural work, I hadn't done it yet. I touched on it, but it wasn't, it wasn't solid. And that was one of the things I needed to do. So like every good story, there's the try-fail cycles, the ups and downs. As you started to have these relatively early successes, did you start to experience any kinds of setbacks, any kind of gut punches? Well, okay, so I want to, I just want to be clear that it didn't feel like this was early stages because I started writing this book in 2007 and I did not get an agent until about 2014. So I, I may have made it sound shorter than that, but it was not short. <laughs> so, uh, so I, I found an agent, you know, wonderful man named Josh Getzler. He was with HG Literary in New York. And he wrote to me saying, you know, he would like to represent me. Um, and then we started working together. And one of the first things he said is, I think we need to talk more about the book. Now, keep in mind, I've already rewritten it 50 times. Okay, so this is try number 51, because he said, you have a 16-year-old protagonist who is still wrestling with some young adult themes, 
her identity, her relationship with her mother. But you also have a plot arc in which you've got things like sabotage and stock schemes and fraud and parliament. He said, there's no YA reader out there who's going to be interested in that. You need to figure out what you're writing. This was the moment when I started recognizing that it wasn't just writing a book that was sort of solid and had good character development and all those things. It was writing a book that would fit someplace on a commercial bookshelf. I needed to find out where my book would fit so I could figure out, he so he could figure out where he could sell it. To think about genre and comparative titles, things like that, that's a, a second layer, I think. You know, you have your writing craft, but then you have to start thinking about, okay, you know, you, you have to be a little canny with respect to the business end of it. So I said, okay, well, I think I want, I think I'm writing a adult mystery. And he said, yeah, I kind of think that's what you're doing too. He said, so you need to go back and restructure your heroine. And again, this is, this is significant structural work. So I aged her up to 19. I started thinking about what kinds of concerns she was going to have and the ways that she might, that this experience of the railway crash and the disaster and the sabotage and, and meeting a railway surgeon named Paul Wilcox and his friend Tom Flynn, who is a shrewd newspaper man who's looking into the sabotage. How is this going to change her? Not just change what she knows about railways, but how is it going to change what she knows about herself? And what she knows about her family and her and her origins. So that was sort of the next step to make sure that it was solidly within the adult mystery genre. Um, and then after that, he sent it out. I remember it was a Friday. We had we found two editors who were interested, which was so exciting. I mean, the the idea of you know my first book going to auction, and then the following week he said, "I'm sorry, they're both passing." The editors took it to their boards and the board said, you know, we don't think the historical market is strong right now for mysteries. We have two other series already that are doing that well. We're going to pass. And we really didn't have anywhere else to go with it. So that was that was sort of a kick in the teeth. That is rough. <laughs> oh, man. You know, and you mentioned what's absolutely the case, which is that first novel for uh, authors, that thing can take years. I... My first novel took about five years. And then that's before it reaches an agent, before it reaches an editor, before it reaches however many people. And then it's coming back to you with, you know, it's more or less bleeding from all the red ink in it. <laughs> it is a learning process, but it sounds like, and just from having read Under a Veiled Moon, you certainly have a strong grasp of characterization, that idea that there's the A plot and the B plot. And how does one move the other? Were there any kind of observations as you were going through that process? Was there any kind of realizations you had that really struck you that you thought you had figured out, but as you're on draft number 51, you go, oh, you know, was there kind of an aha moment? I think one of the things that happens for me late in the process is that I get to know my characters well enough that I can put them in a room and they talk to each other and move and I just write it down. And that was one of the things that happened in one of those late drafts of Lady in the Smoke where I had Elizabeth, Lady Elizabeth, who is concealing the fact that she is landed gentry. She just wants to sort of be herself. So what has happened is the railway crash has happened. And what was typical, and this is all true, is that people from the nearby town would come and bring their wagons and people would get in the wagons and then they would take them back to hotels and things like that so that they could be taken care of because most of them had things like broken bones and concussions and all this kind of thing. They're, they're at this, this inn, basically, kind of a hotel, and Elizabeth is helping the railway surgeon. Elizabeth is basically a little banged up, but she's fine. And she is not squeamish. She has helped birth horses and all kinds of things on her family's estate. And so she goes down to the hot kitchen and she says, yeah, can I help you? And Paul Wilcox, the doctor, says, yes, um, here, you hold this chlor chloroform here and this, you know, I mean, she, she's, she, she spends the night in the kitchen helping him, which is not something that a lady is supposed to be doing. 
So she keeps her dis- she keeps her identity secret. While Paul's best friend Tom Flynn, the canny newspaper man, uh, he has figured out who she is, and he's angry. He thinks that she is just doing it for some sort of stupid game or to be coy, or and and she doesn't like newspaper men because there's a newspaper man who actually completely ruined. Uh, her best friend's brother's life by printing rumors as fact. So they don't trust each other at all. She comes in from a walk and the maid says, oh, there's someone in the parlor waiting for you. And there's Tom Flynn standing there with his hands jammed in his pockets, scowling. And she walks in and she pulls her shawl kind of closer around her, crosses her arms. And But it was the first time ever that I just put these two people in a room and they started talking and moving around and I could see the chair. She was standing behind the chair. He's moving around toward the window. I mean, there, I could just see the whole thing. Like it was a movie that someone else had done and directed. And I just scribbled down as quickly as I could what was happening. And that was the first time that it happened for me. And then I began to understand why it's important that you know your primary characters and your secondary characters as well as possible, because you want to be able to put them in a room and have them talk to each other and know what they're going to say. So it's the dark night of the soul for you, Karen, but things seem to turn around for you. When did you realize you had gone pro? Was it kind of a organic experience for you or more of an aha moment? Well, after Josh told me that no one wanted my book, which at the time was called The Viscount's Daughter, um, I thought, well, I'm going to get started on another one. Like, isn't that what you do? I had this idea based in part on Charles Dickens' older sister, Fanny, who in the 1820s was a brilliant pianist. She was studying at the Royal Academy of Music with one of Beethoven's protégés, like that kind of brilliant. But the Dickens family was notoriously in and out of debt. You know, Dickens writes very movingly about this. His father was always had money and then would immediately lose it. Exactly. And they were in and out of the workhouse and this kind of thing. Anyway, so at a certain point, Fanny was not able to pay tuition at the academy and she had to quit. And she died not long after. I mean, she died young. I thought this was just terribly tragic. And I thought, what if instead of a young woman, you know, not being able to pay tuition and being able to really do nothing about it, there's nothing, there was no way for her to earn money. What if there was a way she could earn money? What happened was I was in London. My husband was actually traveling for work and I went with him. That's the best way to go to London, by the way. And uh, on somebody else's dime, I went to the Royal Academy where Fanny had studied. And they actually have the ledger with Francis Elizabeth Dickens in handwriting. You know, you can actually see it. It's kind of cool. That's so cool. And it happened that there was, there's like a little museum room off the foyer and they had a whole presentation about music halls. So this is why I love the Victorian period. This is not something I knew anything about. I mean, five years of studying the Victorian period, and I really knew nothing about music halls. I had no idea that there were hundreds of them and that they had everything from, you know, dog trainers to trapeze artists, singers, men in drag. These were the first places where people could go and eat and see a show. If they didn't like what they saw, they would throw food. They, this is much more like a Saturday Night Live skit kind of thing than anything sort of polished and beautiful, but they were really popular. They were they were affordable. Um, working classes could come, and all of them, all of these music halls had to have a pianist playing the interlude music and the accompaniment music. So, for example, when you switched over from the magician in you know the first magician, and then you you know they've got to get um, you know a, a dog trainer on stage, you need the transition music. So. I thought, what if I had a heroine be able to be a pianist? Now, the pianists were men, but the male performers were paid 20 shillings a week and the the women were paid 10. So I have Nell dress up as a man. And everybody knows she's a woman, like after the first few weeks, but nobody cares because she's good at her job and good pianists who can like improv, you know, are, are hard to come by. And um, I thought, okay, so, so I, start, I start working on this book. And I'm about maybe 40,000, 50,000 words in. Um, I was actually lucky enough to find the one remaining Victorian music hall in all of London. It's called Wilton's. It's in Grace's Lane. It's uh, in Whitechapel. 
And I got to see it and walk around and see the plaster falling off the walls and the whole bit. It was fantastic. So I was able to start working on this book and I was churning out words fast because when I was standing there in that music hall, the story began to come together. I had about 40,000 words in or so. And I get an email from Josh saying, somebody wants your Railway Crash novel. Uh, and it was an editor at Random House Alibi, which is a subdivision. And they were only doing ebooks at the time, which is kind of unusual. I was like, well, it's not going to end up in a real bookstore, but it's still kind of cool. So I began working with this editor. Her name was Priyanka Krishnan. Uh, you know, again, she had me rewrite sections of the book yet again. But it ended up doing really well. And it was a great learning experience for me. One thing, for example, was that the marketing team hated the title of the Viscount's Daughter. They said it sounded like too bodice rippery. Um, it, nobody's going to know how to pronounce Viscount. They're going to say Viscount. I mean, I'm like, okay. you know. <laughs> um, so we ended up having to do these titles. I, I, so I would come up with like five or six titles and I would send them to Josh and he would send them to Priyanka and she'd send them on to marketing and they hated all of them. And then they'd come back with titles that I, I didn't like. And it, it was just this back and forth. We eventually settled on a title that Priyanka wrote called A Lady in the Smoke. We could all live with that. Um, I think we were all exhausted by that point. I mean, John, it got so bad that Josh was calling it choo-choo go boom because he's like, I can't keep track of what it's being called right now. It's still what he calls it. Uh, and then came the, the drama of the cover. So they sent over a cover and said, isn't it great? And I called my friend Stephanie, who had written a few books by that point, And I said, it's all wrong. The train is like 50 years. Like it, it, the train wasn't around until the 1920s. And that dress, no decent woman would walk out in that. It's like you walk out in your pajamas. And Stephanie said to me, mm -hmm. in my experience, when I am shown a cover, I'm allowed to say two things. Wow, it's great. Or wow, I love it. You don't get input. But I contacted Josh because I was like, I can't sit with this. And he said, okay. He says, so he took my concerns to Priyanka. And to, to give her credit, she said, okay, you tell me what you know needs to change. And I said, okay, well, first of all, it has to be this kind of train and this kind of dress. And, and they did. They did a fantastic job on the cover. So it came out, it ended up looking like this. I don't know if you can see it, but there's the train and the cover, but it was still only an ebook. And then I know that you've talked to Barb a little bit about his, his give out book, Bob. They did a 99 cent book bug sale and I landed on the USA Today bestseller list. Um, I was three ahead of the SAT review book, which was really impressive to my daughter. You know, the book ended up selling like 35,000 copies and it ended up being an audiobook. When, you know, when you ask, you know, when did you first realize that you really had gone pro? It was about a week before the book came out because I got an email from someone, someone I did not know, not a friend, but, and she said, you know, I just want to let you know, I, you know, I reviewed your book on, on Goodreads. I really loved it. And kind of she told, told me, I'm like, what's Goodreads? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what Goodreads was. You know, this is back in 2016. And um, and and I was like, oh my God, a complete stranger is writing to me saying. And so I got on, you know, I made a Goodreads account. I got on and holy cow, I had 20 reviews for this book because, you know, they had sent it out on NetGalley to try and generate interest and, and all that kind of stuff. So I was floored. I thought, oh my gosh, I don't know any of these people and they're all reading my book. And that's just the 20 who wrote their reviews too. Yeah. It doesn't include the however many people who just read it and told a friend mm -hmm. or just were thinking about it nonstop days after reading it. One question, historical fiction writers, historicity is a big deal for us. When it came to the cover art, it sounded like you were able to get it to be historically accurate. Has that a bit been a consistent concern that's occurred over you know, the course of your writing career where you've looked at the first draft of the cover and just thought, nope, that's the wrong kind of hat. There's no way there'd be that kind of boat there. Has that been a consistent theme or has that kind of worked itself out? No, there are covers I'm happier with than others. I was really happy with A Trace of Deceit. Um, I don't know if you can see behind me that one. The, the dress is right. And it was interesting because the original, the original cover had a painting in the upper right hand corner, there was just kind of like a red kind of nothing. And I said, is there any way we can take that out and put the Francois Boucher painting that is actually stolen out of Edwin's room in that frame? And I said, yeah, we can do that. So things like that were, 
you know, we're, we're, we were able to do. Interestingly, with Down a Dark River, which is the first of the Inspector Corvin series, and has uh, as a protagonist who is a man, there were no women police until 1920s in London. The publisher originally wanted to put a young woman on the cover. The first cover, in fact, you can still see it because it is in the, if you look in the audiobook version, it still has the original cover. It was a young woman with beautiful blonde hair. And I said to Josh, I don't feel comfortable with this because, I mean, there are, there's, you know, I am not the only person writing Victorian mysteries with, you know, inspectors at Scotland Yard. And so, for example, Will Thomas and um, Al Grecian, and they all have a man on the cover. And it's a way of cueing readers that this has a male protagonist. Most of the women in Down a Duck River are dead, lying in boats. <laughs> I, this just didn't make any sense. And Josh said, no, it really doesn't make sense. So let me, I'm going to talk to the publisher about this. And they went back and forth, back and forth, um, because the feeling was that a young woman would sell books better. Um, the problem was, you know, for, for me, I just felt like it was a kind of like a poor trailer to a movie. And, you know, eventually the publisher, you know, kind of came to an agreement and Down a Dark River, which is this one, you know, he has a man on the cover. There he is. And under Veiled Moon, there was kind of really no question. You know, they wanted to keep a kind of consistency of tone and, and everything and typeface and, you know, put them on the cover. I, I've been lucky in that my publisher has been willing to take my ideas and stuff into account every time. One question I like to ask writers is going through these journeys and prefacing everything they've been through. Karen, how are you different today, not only as a writer, but just as a person compared to when you set out on your writer's journey? It's a great question. I don't think, well, let me put it to you this way. In some ways, writing these five books is sort of like raising children. Because, you know, when you have children, at least from my experience, they really kicked out the walls of my heart, challenged me in ways I couldn't have imagined, brought me so much joy that you can't know ahead of time. You don't, you know, you don't know what you don't know kind of thing. Um, and, and I think that that's somewhat true for writing books. I've written five and with each one, it has been an emotional reckoning and an intellectual unfolding. Um, I've learned a tremendous amount about the period doing all of the research. Of course, that's always the fun part. You know, finding the fun historical factoid that you could like nudge in there and it can turn your plot. That's always fun. But emotionally, I think I've come to terms with certain things that I had to work through sort of by writing, by, by writing these books. I, for example, I, just as a simple example, in A Trace of Deceit, it is ostensibly a story about a young woman who is an artist and her brother Edwin dies and she wants to find out why. And Edwin, her older brother, is ex like she's a good, a very good artist. He is a genius and his talent was discovered young. He was very gifted. His father wanted him to stand in front of his easel at eight hours a day. His mother was trying to let him be a kid. So there was a very tight little triangle. And Annabelle was over here at the side watching this. And I was writing about how giftedness is marvelous, but it can also create some challenging family dynamics. So I'm writing this book and, you know, a friend kind of early on said, oh, you're writing about your dad. Now, my dad passed away in 2012. He was a gifted pianist. He was one of three children, the youngest. His two older brothers, five and six years older were sort of hail strapping lads, you know, who would go out and play football. And they were each other's best friend. And my father, who was five years younger, was more delicate. He had a perfect pitch. Um, his best friend became the piano. I think that it can set someone up for a particular kind of psychological dynamic when you are playing with something that literally only plays what you want to play and doesn't challenge you. My father, as a result, was not always great with people, not always good at understanding how what he said came across. When he died, we weren't close. We never had been. But 
I had to figure out a way to understand his giftedness and how it made him who he was, and also how to grieve someone who I had never been close to. How, you know, how do you grieve what could have been? Those kind of emotional journeys were part of my writing. So if I've changed, it's partly been because I've had to sort of like in therapy, I suppose, write my way out of some of these, out of some of these, you know, situations. Well, it's kind of like you said earlier that writing is one part therapy and uh, one part storytelling and how they then diagram. And that isn't just for figuring out how these characters think and develop. It's also books don't just come out of a vacuum. Mm -hmm. They come from us. It always makes me wonder as I'm writing something, I think, how much of me is in this? Sometimes it's 1%. Or if I'm writing something like right now with an ensemble cast, I wonder if I'm just kind of the spice sprinkled across the actual meal that's all these different people, or if I'm the actual meal in some cases, and I think, <laughs> am I working through something here? Mm -hmm. But I, I completely understand. It. And I think that's a, that's a great observation that, well, I, I guess it's just, it's heartfelt. And I think a lot of writers can relate to it. It's something we usually trip over too. I don't think a lot of writers who have those kinds of, oh, you're writing about blank moments realize that we're writing about blank it's yeah. when somebody points it out one of my characters is a, a reflection of my thoughts on mortality not always the most upbeat perspective on them but in, in it takes things on in a very pragmatic sense and sometimes i wonder about that i go how much of that do i actually believe has it has it been over the course of these books you've been writing not only with say the relationship you had with your father and his passing, do you feel like there's been a catharsis? Oh, it, it, that has happened with almost every single book. In fact, I'd say it probably happened with all five. For example, with Under a Veiled Moon, I had written the whole entire book or most of it. And, but I was still kind of not quite getting my fingers on how Corbin was changing and why and what his what his core issue is. So his when he comes out of Whitechapel, he is uh, strong. He is decisive. He's good with his knife. He's good with his fists. He is a rescuer. That's how he ended up with the Doyle family because one day he was, you know, I guess he was 15 years old. He's walking along an alley. He hears three guys beating up a fourth one and calling him dirty Irish. And he whips out his knife and grabs the biggest one. He intercedes and he ends up getting beaten up for his trouble, but he does manage to get himself and Pat Doyle away. And Pat says, come home with me, you know, because you've got a big cut on your face and my mom will fix us up. <laughs> so he, that's how he ends up with the, with the Doyle family by being a rescuer. So one of the things that comes out of his childhood is he realizes being a rescuer gets me loved. I get appreciation. I get a sense of identity from being a rescuer, from being strong, from being willing to, you know, tackle the hard things, use my knife if I have to. And that's all great for being a policeman. But in Down a Dark River, one of the things Belinda points out, his, his love interest, Belinda points out, she said, you know, that's all well and good, but you do need to admit that always being the rescuer has some psychological payoff for you. Now she doesn't use those terms because of course that's not Victorian, but she says, you know, it, it, it benefits you. You never, you never have to be vulnerable and you don't like to be vulnerable. And he says, Oh, poo poo. That has nothing to do with it. <laughs> and then, of course, later on he recognizes other day he recognizes that being a rescuer certainly has its benefits, but there is an expense, you know, and he, he realizes he needs to work in some of the vulnerability and be able to sit with someone who is being vulnerable if he is going to be a better policeman. And it's only when he does that that he can solve the case. So he has learned that, that okay, being a rescuer is great, but you need to have some vulnerability tucked in there as well. But his central dynamic is, I want to be a rescuer. I like being a rescuer. It makes me feel important. It makes me feel good, you know, kind of thing. And so in Down a Dark River, that happens. But then in Under Veiled Moon, the whole rescuing thing returns. Because I believe, as people, we generally have a tree we walk around. In Under a Veiled Moon, you know, you've got Colin, who is 18 years old and getting into all kinds of trouble, and Corvin wants to help him out, but there's there's some backstory there that needs to sort of be excavated. So when I was writing the book, I was thinking, okay, this is about rescuing, this is about, you know, I'm kind of like fumbling around with trying to figure out what exactly is happening here. 
and it just so happened that my son, who was 18, he just, he'd left, he left for college. And my husband and I were sitting around talking one night and he made some comment. He was talking about things that we maybe could have done better as parents, things maybe we could have done better as people or in our careers. And he says, you know, sometimes I wonder how we all live with the stupid stuff we've done. <laughs> I go flying out of my chair and I go running over. And fortunately, my husband, you know, he's like, oh, there she goes again. And I and I ran over and I scribbled the words down because they had the ring of truth. And I said, oh, my God, that that's what Corbin is wrestling with. He is wrestling with this idea that, you know, we have regrets and there's some that you cannot undo. You can't change. And then what do you do with that? How do you sit with it? How do you use it to help you go forward and grow and become a better person? But that's what that's what Under a Veiled Moon is really about. So it looks like it's about a steamship disaster, but it's really about someone who's coming to terms with the fact that you can't undo all your mistakes and you're going to have to sit with it. It's not comfortable. All right, Karen, so goody time. You get to share knowledge with us. This is Mm. arguably my favorite part because I always learn something new, anything from mindfulness to favorite books. What kind of advice do you have for aspiring writers? I guess the first thing I would say, and it is not going to be original, I know, is to read widely in your chosen genre. Know where your book is going to sit on the shelf with respect to other people because that is going to be one of the first things that an agent and an editor is going to ask you. And so you want to have some comparison titles. They can also provide some guidance as you are developing your book about where the inciting event needs to be, how often you need to up the stakes, what kinds of things you can use to up the stakes. I mean, that kind of thing. So that's the first one is to read widely. Number two, I would say, Join a professional organization such as Sisters in Crime or, I mean, I have found Sisters in Crime really to be so helpful, but there are others, MWA, Missouri Writers of America, um, Society for Children, Book Writers and Illustrators, if you're writing YA or middle grade, there there are a lot of other ones out there, Historical Novel Society, because a lot of these organizations not only have people that you can reach out to and say, hey, can I exchange work with you? That kind of thing. But they also have a lot of online resources, particularly since COVID, when everything went Zoom, a lot of online resources, which they call webinars or online seminars on craft, newsletter development, website development, characters, secondary characters, querying an agent, all of these kinds of topics. And they're just there for you to type in a search question and up it pops. And you can, as a member, you can watch the 35 or 40 minute video on YouTube that, that, you know, where somebody in the field is talking about it. So those are two things. And then the third is, I don't know, again, this isn't going to be very original, but be persistent. I'm not going to say that everybody is meant to be a published writer. I'm not sure that it, that it's true. Um, I would like to think that everybody could get published and have their story out there because I think everyone has an interesting story to tell that they alone can tell. I would just say be persistent because I think there are some people that I know who, who I read their early material and they had a lot of promise and they gave up. Well, I think most of us could say the same thing about ourselves. Publish, I'm sure. You know, I'm sure the first draft of Carrie by Stephen King probably read like garbage. An experienced writer would have said, just just give up. Yeah, so that persistence element is massive. This is one that I kind of love, and it is so hard to do, but you read your work out loud, and you are far braver than I am for doing that. Can you tell us why we should be reading our writing out loud? As I get toward the end of, you know, maybe my, whatever, my fifth or sixth draft of a book, and I'm getting close where I feel like it's beginning to come together and feels really solid. Um, Yes, I do. I read the whole entire thing out loud, start to finish, because your ear will catch what your eye misses. And I'm not just talking about the typos, you know, where you've left the word the out of the sentence. I'm talking about times when you realize that your dialogue is going on for too long or where you have way too many tags, or you you have people shrugging, two or three p- people shrugging on the same page. You, <laughs> your, your ear will catch it even if your eye doesn't. It's amazing what you will hear. Awkward repetitions, 
times when you are using the same phrase to describe two different people. So that is that is something that I've done with all of my books, not the first one, but the second one, I learned about that. It's making me realize that my characters nod to the point where they all have permanent neck damage. Yes. <laughs> so much nodding. <laughs> well, I did, yeah, mine, mine, I just remember, I can't remember which one of my books it was, but everybody was shrugging. People were shrugging, you know, it's like, okay, exactly. It's like shoulder damage because like, was, everyone's shrugging. I wanted to say though, your shrugging is top notch. <laughs> you had one point where a character just lifts one shoulder and I was like, you know what? That is a subversion yes. of expectations and shrugging that great execution. Well, thank you. So another thing that I would suggest is I know that people often say, write what you know, but I don't believe that that means write what you know from your own lived experience. And obviously I'm writing in 1870s London. I am not writing from my experience. I'm also writing about a man who is a former thief and a bare knuckles boxer and Irish in Whitechapel. So I am not writing what I know from my own experience, but I am writing what I know from my research. And so I caution people who say, you know, oh, I'm a lonely lot to write what I know. Get to know what you need to know. Uh, you know, sit down and do the research and get online and read whatever it is you need to read and look at pictures, you know, whatever time period you're working in and find letters and newspaper articles and do the digging so that you have, you know, that you have the knowledge that you need. There's a couple other things you're just sort of, I'm just going to toss out anecdotally, but one of the things that I did when I was making the transition from writing Young Women Heroines to my inspector, Michael Corabin in with Down a Dark River, before I started writing each day, I read one or two pages of a 1870s police report, which is, of course, written by a man, out loud to put it in my ear because I didn't want to sound like a woman writing a man. I really wanted to sound as close as I could to an 1870s man. Reading that out loud helps. I also read uh, Wilkie Collins or Charles Dickens or Mary Elizabeth Breden out loud because they are, they're writing in the 1860s and 70s, their vocabulary and their cadence and some of the words that they use make their way into my book. Now that said, I'm going to tell you a funny story about verisimilitude because there is something called, you know, obviously we're all aiming for truth. And I use the author note in the back of my book as my get out of jail free card. I say, okay, I'm just going to let you know that, yes, I know I moved to church from one part of London to another part of London because I like the name. All that kind of stuff is in, is in that author note in the back. But, you know, we're aiming at verisimilitude, not necessarily truth. And one of my favorite stories is from my friend, Susan Elliott McNeil. Because she writes a book set in World War II about Maggie Hope. She writes a whole series. One of the things that she did in preparation was to go to Churchill's war rooms and read Churchill's correspondence. She found, you know, copies of it, read it. He uses OMG what? to mean, oh, my God. It because, and you think about this because, I mean, they were used to writing telegrams because, and you paid by the word. So, so he had, he had some of these, you know, I mean, he didn't use LOL, but OMG, you know, he, he did use. What's interesting is she said, you know, obviously that is true. It's in his letter. I cannot put that in a book yeah because even though it's true, it would destroy the verisimilitude. Some, some you know, wise ass reader is going to write to me and say something along the lines of, oh, so what's he going to say? LOL or LMAO next, you know, kind of thing. He's, he's not texting. So that's why you have to kind of be a little careful. And one of the things that, you know, one reader took me to task for and said, you know, the Victorians didn't drink coffee. They drank tea. That is actually not true. Victorians did drink coffee. <laughs> and in fact, some of the most beautiful coffee services in the museums in London are from the 1870s because people were still drinking coffee. But you want to be a little careful about what generally people believe to be true about the period um, and be careful with your details. 
that's what beta readers are good for. I have five beta readers that I send as I'm getting to those final stages. It goes out to all five of them. And there's three mystery writers, one historical fiction writer, one professor of Victorian literature. And they, you know, come back to me with things that catch them or pull them out of the story. And I have to think about, okay, do I, do I want to include the fact that Corvin drinks a lot of coffee because, you know, that's going to trip somebody up, that kind of thing. So just, you know, weigh that whole truth versus verisimilitude um, bit a little bit. I'm so glad I can talk to somebody about this because, you know, I have characters that are over 2000 years old and I can't say that the character stood on a, you know, a plinth and scanned the horizon. Uh, that's a technological verb. I can say they panned the horizon, something like that. Yeah. That comes up all the time. But then I have to remind myself, these people spoke a language called Punic. They didn't speak American English. So automatically, we're already in kind of uh, cognitive dissonance territory here. Yeah, sure. So refreshing to talk to somebody. I want to pick your brain for another couple hours, <laughs> but I want to be mindful of your time. You've got more great books to write. So Karen, thanks so much for sharing your preface with me today. It was a lot of fun. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. And there you have it. It's our conversation with Karen Odin. I really want to thank her again. That was a lot of fun. You can hear it in my voice, trying to keep it contained. Uh, didn't do such a great job at times. As I mentioned, and I think it's pretty uh, something I admire a great deal, and Karen is her willingness to read her own work out loud. I have done this with students, but rarely with myself. And I think it was a bit of a little bit of a wake up call. I need to start doing that. It's embarrassing. You hear these things, and even though you believe in them, hopefully the things you write, you believe in them. And hopefully you enjoy the way they sound eventually. Maybe don't read that first draft out loud. <laughs> That's what I gathered. Karen waits a couple drafts. Wise. But it's worth the risk hearing yourself. Maybe there's some kind of therapy there as well. Now, Karen described the act of writing as being very therapeutic. Maybe reading it out loud as part of that therapy. Like I mentioned at the top, you can find all of Karen's publications on www.karenodden.com. Odin spelled O-D-D-E-N. You can find all those books through Barnes & Noble, Amazon, as well as Books A Million. And she is on the social medias, Facebook at Karen Odin, Twitter at Karen underscore Odin, Instagram at Karen underscore M underscore Odin. Once again, I just want to thank you for checking out the author's preface. This is a nascent thing, but I'm proud of it. Worked very hard on it. And I've had wonderful guests so far who've been so charitable with their time. And that includes you. You put a lot of time into listening to this. I'm sure there are all kinds of other things you might be interested in checking out. So peeping tap, peeping tap, that just sounds strange. Peeping the author's preface it means a lot to me. But if you enjoyed the show, of course, you can always write a review. 10 out of 5 stars if you like. It's always appreciated. You can also find the show on YouTube if you'd like. I know some people prefer watching or listening to pods that way. But that's all I've got for today. I hope you have an excellent rest of the day. And if you are writing, may all your endeavors go frustratingly well. Stay humble, folks. <laughs>